All right, so today we are moving on to a chapter uh, entitled Responsibility, Descent, Justice, and Character. And we're going to look specifically at the topic of whistleblowing. Uh, I'm concentrating primarily on the article from Gene James in Defense of Whistleblowing on page 315, um, which will, of course, also give us the pro and con side as usual. But we'll start off here with a basic definition. Whistleblowing is the public disclosure by a person working within an organization of acts, omissions, practices, or policies perceived as morally wrong by that person, and is a disclosure regarded as wrongful by that organization's authorities. Okay. So when we think about whistleblowing, this is something we hear about in the news every once in a while. Um, someone perceives of some wrongdoing taking place inside of the company, and they alert someone else about this information. The idea is, because that person is on the inside, they are seeing what's going on. They're recognizing the problems that are being faced. And as a result, uh, they are trying to do their duty to the public by letting others know about this problem so that the issue can be taken care of, so it can be resolved. So essentially, there are three elements to the topic of whistleblowing. Uh, first, there is the perception by someone within the organization that something is morally wrong. So somebody inside the company, the organization, has to see a wrongdoing and has to um, recognize it as being wrong. Secondly, there must be the communication of that perception to another party. Now this might be um, someone higher up within the company. Maybe it's their boss or their, their uh, uh, head, of, head of personnel or whatever, but it could be somebody inside the company. It could also be someone um, outside of the company, maybe the news agents, uh, maybe the, the newspapers, the press. Uh, it could be a government agency as well, so there's a lot of possibilities, but you have to communicate it to someone else. And thirdly, in a whistleblowing case, there has to be the perception by someone within the organization that the disclosure should not have been made. Uh, and that's not going to be hard, because if there is some wrongdoing, then at the very least, the people implicated in the wrongdoing are going to not want this information made public. Uh, but those are the three basic criteria for whistleblowing. We also learn here that there are several different types of whistleblowing that uh, occur. The most common, which I've already kind of alluded to, is the distinction between an internal and an external form of whistleblowing. Internal whistleblowing means that you tell someone within the company. You work your way up through the chain of command. External means that you tell someone outside of the company, such as the press or the FBI. And basically, you just have to think in terms of what would be the reasoning or the rationale to decide what would be best. Uh, is this a relatively small issue that maybe somebody higher up in the company is unaware of? Uh, then internal whistleblowing might be the way to go. Uh, just let someone higher up know what's going on. On the other hand, is this something where there's a genuine uh, great harm to society? Is there a situation where the um, uh, action is illegal, then maybe an external might be the necessary approach for you to take. Uh, actually, most companies encourage the idea of an internal whistleblowing. And in fact, we'll have uh, like a, uh, an anonymous hotline that you could go to in order to um, uh, reveal this information to those people higher up within the company. But external is almost always discouraged. Because when you engage in external whistleblowing, you are bringing bad press, bad publicity to the company. And those within the company are not going to want that action to take place. But that's the first distinction, is between internal and external whistleblowing. The second distinction is between current and alumni. Current whistleblowing means that you're still working within the company when you blow the whistle whereas alumni means that you've left the company before blowing the whistle. Now, there's pros and cons to both of these, because let's face it, since the company doesn't want you to blow the whistle, at least externally, 
um, for the bad pub publicity, there's usually some kind of punitive measure that's taken against the whistleblower. Whistleblowers have been uh, treated very badly down through the ages. And so if you are a current whistleblower, you are putting yourself at much greater risk because you're still working for that company, meaning that it's going to be a lot easier for them to be able to, uh, to uh, punish you for your act of whistleblowing. On the other hand, uh, you are going to be current within that company, which means that you can see everything that's going on, you can keep an eye on the situation, and so your information is as up-to-date as possible. If you are an alumni whistleblower, then you're essentially protecting yourself because you've gone somewhere else, you found another job before you blow the whistle. The problem is, of course, that the information you have is going to be very quickly dated. <clears throat> So you have to make that decision. Are you going to be current or alumni? The third uh, distinction is between open and anonymous. If you're an open whistleblower, then that means that you go public, you let everybody know that it's you who are the whistleblower. But if you're anonymous, that means that you do not reveal your identity as the whistleblower. And again, there's pros and cons to both of these. If you are an open whistleblower, then you're staking your name and reputation behind what you say, which means that people are going to be much more likely to believe you uh, when you make these claims. I mean, why would, you, why would you risk your reputation to state something false? <clears throat> but, of course, since everybody knows who you are, it leaves you wide open for retaliation. If you're an anonymous whistleblower then, of course, you're protecting yourself because nobody knows that it's you. But on the other hand, people might think, oh, well, maybe you've just got a grievance against the company. Maybe you, uh, you know, are, are not really believing or, or having genuine information. Maybe you're just upset at your boss or your company and you're trying to get back at them in some way by creating problems. They're not as likely to believe you if you uh, go at it in an anonymous way. Um, so that's the distinction between open and anonymous. But, you know, again, uh, even though open might be better in the sense of getting people to believe you, anonymous whistleblowing still has a tremendous amount of power. We shouldn't forget that the entire Nixon presidency was brought down by anonymous whistleblowing. Now these uh, repercussions that I mentioned sometimes can become very serious. Individuals will... Um, have in the past, they have uh, found themselves being passed over for promotion, uh, being shifted to a night duty or third shift. Uh, sometimes people are fired from their job for engaging in whistleblowing. Um, there have been <clears throat> people who have been blackballed from their entire industry uh, for the act of whistleblowing. In fact, uh, one of the guys that's mentioned in uh, the case study for this one, Case 9, Roger Bijolet, was uh, not only blackballed from the engineering industry, but he was hounded and hunted so severely by the uh, members of NASA after this that he suffered a complete mental breakdown. So the, the repercussions can be very, very serious uh, at times. Well, because the government has recognized that there are times when whistleblowing is in the public's best interest, they wanted to do something about this. So starting in 1984, they began to enact what are known as Whistleblower Protection Acts. Whistleblower Protection Acts were put in place to give some type of protection to the legitimate whistleblower so that that uh, individual has a safety net in uh, promoting the act of whistleblowing. And so, as of these laws, a person is not supposed to be able to be punished because they are a whistleblower. But these acts are not all that effective. Part of the problem is that they are not a national, but rather a regional. And so, as you travel from one place to another, your rights might differ from one place to another. And because of that, uh, you might start yourself questioning, well, what can I do, what can't I do in any given area? Uh, the other problem, of course, is that although you're not allowed, say, to fire somebody, uh, or to pass them over for, for promotion because they are a whistleblower, that hasn't stopped employers from finding other reasons to fire these people or to punish them in some way. They just have to be a little more clever about it. 
but it hasn't done a tremendous amount to protect the whistleblower, unfortunately. But the idea was there, and the idea is sound. Speaking in terms of the act of whistleblowing, um, Gene James, in his article on 315, mentions that uh, when it comes to the idea of corporations and businesses, uh, what we have to concern ourselves with is what is called agency law. Agency law is the law governing employees' relations to employers. And under agency law, there is a very strict code of confidentiality in place, unless the wrongdoing involves a felony. At that point, there becomes a duty to whistleblow, but not before. Under agency law, um, the, the code of confidentiality is there between the employer and the employee. And this makes a lot of sense, because if you are part of that company, working for that company, then your interests are tied up with that company's interests. If they suffer, you will suffer. There's an old saying that you shouldn't rock the boat you're sailing in, and that's kind of the idea here. So under agency law, um, you should maintain a strict code of confidentiality. Let's say, for example, that um, you're working for a cookie manufacturer, and they've just discovered a new recipe. They've put it out there. It's very effective. Everybody wants to buy it. it it's, you know, the, the product can't stay on the shelves. And so it is really good and in your interest to make sure that that secret recipe stays secret. Because if you let it out, um, then every other cookie manufacturer is going to make theirs in the same way and you're going to lose your competitive edge. So you want to maintain that confidentiality. However, suppose that you discovered after a while that the reason why these cookies are selling so quickly, why they seem to be so addictive, is because they're laced with LSD. Well, now you've got a felony situation. Now you have a felony uh, in place, because that is illegal under federal law. And so now there is a duty to violate the confidentiality under agency law. But that under agency law is the only time where there is a duty to whistleblow. <clears throat> Gene James, of course, is going to argue very strongly in favor of the idea of whistleblowing, uh, saying that it is in the public's best interest. His opponent in this is a guy called Richard DeGeorge. Now, Richard DeGeorge, uh, even though he is believing also that there is a time for whistleblowing, uh, his views fall much more in line with the idea of agency law, whereas James wants a much more loose and liberal interpretation. But in any event, uh, DeGeorge says that basically we have to meet certain criteria before we should consider the idea of whistleblowing. First, just to be justified in the act of whistleblowing, we have to meet these two basic criteria. First, there must be a great harm. The greater the harm, the greater the obligation. So before we're even justified in thinking about engaging in whistleblowing, there has to be a genuine harm, a serious threat. And the greater the threat to the society, the greater the obligation becomes to blow the whistle. Both James and uh, DeGeorge feel the same on that issue. Uh, they are going to be in agreement there, but that's where the agreement stops. Because DeGeorge says that, secondly, we must work our way up through the entire chain of command prior to going public. Um, so basically, we have to exhaust all of the internal options before we ever even consider whistleblowing externally. If we meet those two criteria, then according to DeGeorge, we have the justification for blowing the whistle, but we're still not obligated to do so. To be obligated to blow the whistle, we have to meet these other two criteria. First, we need full documentation to prove the harm. It can't just be hearsay. It just can't be an overheard conversation somewhere, or something you caught out of the side of your eye. You need full, clear documentation to prove your case. And finally, there must be a belief that going public is going to do some good. Because after all, you are putting the interest of your company, 
uh, at risk by going public. You are putting your own well-being at risk by going public. So why would you do that unless you knew for sure that it's going to change something, unless you knew for sure that it's going to do some good? For DeGeorge, we must meet all of these criteria before we are obligated to blow the whistle. But Gene James says that these criteria, they're too strict. Uh, again, they agree on point one, but with point two, you know, sometimes this is an issue where it needs to be resolved right here and right now. Not later, but now. And working your way through the chain of command takes a lot of time. And you also, of course, as you're sending it up from one level of business to the next, to the next, to the next, you're going to find yourself in a situation where eventually it's going to come to the desk of somebody that's deeply implicated in this, and that's going to get buried right there. It's not going to go any further. So you may need to act more quickly than the internal allows you to. As far as full documentation, James says that uh, you're very seldom ever going to have that. I mean, if there's a legitimate wrongdoing taking place, people are not going to leave a strong paper trail. Maybe all you can have is a, a overheard conversation. But document what you can, but don't worry about getting full documentation. And fourthly, there has to be a belief that going public is going to do some good. Well, how do you know whether it's going to do any good until you've tried it? Right? How do you know whether it's going to actually serve any purpose or do any good until you've actually tried it to see whether it will? And also, what do you mean by doing some good? Um, it might, you know, it might be the case that um, uh, you save one peop one person. You might save ten thousand people. What do you mean by doing some good? So he feels that uh, the criteria set by DeGeorge are just simply far too strong. Instead, he says that what we should do is simply look at some basic criteria. And uh, my timing is running out on this, so I'm not going to read through all of these, but I will point out that starting on page 309 over on to 320, there is a list of certain elements, certain things that DeGeorge, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, James feels that you need to do in order to um, uh, make that decision as to uh, whether or not you should engage in the act of whistleblowing or not. Uh, let me give you the page number there. So there's DeGeorge's checklist uh, that we need to consider. So before you consider whether an act of whistleblowing is justified or not, uh, you may want to consider what Richard DeGeorge says in terms of his criteria for whistleblowing. You may also want to consider James's argument that it makes more sense to engage in uh, whistleblowing more often because it's in the public's best interest. My basic view tends to side more with DeGeorge simply because I think that if we whistleblowed more often, uh, we would become sort of complacent to it. We wouldn't take it seriously in the way that we do now. Uh, when whistleblowing cases come up now, we take them very, very seriously because they are uh, presented to us in, in so infrequently that we think it must legitimately be something. If they came to us more often, uh, we wouldn't have that ability. So, I am uh, 15 seconds away from uh, the end of my tape here, so have a great day, and we'll see you next time.